So we are starting our lecture this morning. We continue looking at GIT, the gastrointestinal tract system. In particular, today we'll be discussing motility function of the GIT. So if you remember very well, the previous lecture that we had, we we're looking at the control of the GIT. So anything to do with control, be it neural control or hormonal control, we looked at that. We had a discussion. Then I'm also going to share videos on it so that you are able to revise on your own. If you want to have a revision, then you can do that at your own time. So today we'll be discussing one of the major functions of the GIT. We know to say that there are four major functions, but today we'll be discussing motility. So we have to go back to the oral cavity. We look at what sort of motilities within the oral cavity all the way to the anus. Then we'll come back again to look at secretions. So this, these are just series of lectures that you need to follow one by one. So let's start for today's lecture. So the major functions of the GIT. So what are the major functions of GIT? So I've already said that there are about four major functions of the GIT. Starting with the first one is motility. Motility is there to propel ingested food from mouth towards the rectum. So the food that you are eating, they have to move from the mouth all the way to the rectum. So it is a function of the GIT, which is called motility, to propel the ingested food to move from point A to point B until it gets to the rectum. So this is the, the function that we'll be discussing today. Then when we start another lecture, we'll look at secretion. So secretion, it will aid in digestion and absorption because from the secretions, that's where you find enzymes. Then you also find some fluids that will also help in absorption. So when you're talking of absorption and digestion, then mainly there is secretion. So that's the second major function of the GIT, secretion. Within these secretions, you find enzymes and other fluids. And of course, you have buffer systems like the bicarbonates that are responsible for neutralization of acids. Then you also have bowel salts and bowel acids that are responsible for emulsification of fat. So all that is found within the secretions. Then the other major function, the third major function is digestion. Of course, the actual mechanical digestion by the use of enzymes. So the mechanical digestion is facilitated by enzyme. So food now is broken down into absorbable molecules. So these absorbable molecules are called monomers. So if you have lipids, you have to digest them into free fatty acids, gristle molecules for them to be absorbed. If you have carbohydrates, they need to be digested into glucose and other forms of monomers for them to be absorbed. Then if you have proteins, they need to be digested into amino acids. So we, looked, we are going to look at digestion later on. So that's another major function of the GIT. Then the last major function is absorption. So you have absorption. So after digestion, whatever has been digested needs to be absorbed. So the body has to internalize the monomers that are coming from digestion. So the nutrients, electrolytes, and water, they have to be absorbed. So that function of the GIT is called absorption. So these are not the only functions of the GIT. These are the major ones. But of course, you have... Also minor functions of the GIT. They are also involved in immunity. You know to say that you have rhymphoid uh, tissue associated with the, the mucosa or the GIT that is there to protect the body from pathogens. So it has immunity function as well. And then it's also involved in excretion. You know to say fecal material after you have absorbed what is required, whatever, um, waste materials are remaining there, they have to be excreted from the body. So it's also involved in excretion. So those are just some minor functions of the GIT. But these are the major ones that we are interested in when we're discussing physiology. Okay, so without wasting much time, we proceed. So the question states the two types of movements because now we are biased towards motility. So motility, it's movement, actually. So state the two types of movements of the GIT. So there are movements that will propel the ingested food from point A to point B. Then there are also movements that will cause mixing of the ingester, mixing. So the two types of movements in the GIT, the first one is propulsive movement. 
the propulsive movement of food towards uh, uh, the the propulsive movement of food forward at an appropriate rate for digestion and absorption to take place. So the the motility or the movement of food forward it has to be controlled. So to provide ample time for digestion also and absorption to take place. So I find that this movement or motility has to be controlled to optimize digestion and also absorption to take place. Then the other one, they are mixing movements. So mixing movements, they are caused by peristalsis and local intermittent contractions. So you have mixing movements or mixing uh, motility that is there to mix the chyme. So as you are mixing the chyme, you are also exposing these nutrients to enzymes that are responsible for digestion. You are also exposing the monomers to surfaces that are responsible for absorption. So you find that there are two major types of movements in the GIT. It could be propulsive, that is moving the ingester from point A to point B, or it could be mixing movements or mixing motility. Okay. So what is mastication? We are starting with what is happening in the mouth. What is mastication? Mastication is the other terminology for chewing. So mastication or chewing is the first mechanical process in the gastrointestinal tract by which the food substances are torn or cut into small particles and crushed or ground into a soft bolus. So when you, you place your food into the oral cavity, there is chewing process that takes place. So this chewing process is actually a mechanical process or mechanical digestion that will break down the food particles so that the bolus can easily be formed and then you can swallow the food. So there is need for the teeth to work on the food so that you break it down into smaller pieces. But what is the significance of mastication? What is the importance of mastication? Why should you chew? Why should you masticate? So the first is to break down all food stuff into smaller pieces, like I said. So as you are eating your shima, it's, it's, it's just big um, shima. Sometimes you are, you are eating solids. So you have granules of those solids. You need to break them down because they are large particles that needs to be broken down into smaller particles to enable you to swallow them. Otherwise, as big as they are, it's very difficult for you to swallow. So the significance of mastication, the first one is to break down of food substance or food stuff into smaller particles. Then this, the second one is mixing of saliva with food substances thoroughly. So you need to mix the food substances with saliva, because in the saliva, you also find some enzymes. You have saliva amylase there that can initiate the digestion of uh, cooked starch. So starch digestion or carbohydrate digestion starts in the oral cavity. So you need to mix the food with the saliva, and that is also going to help to lubricate the bolus so that as you swallow, it doesn't really uh, give you a lot of problems because in the saliva also you find mucus. So when you cover the bolus with the mucus, it's very easy for it to be swallowed. So you are mixing the saliva with the food substances thoroughly also. As you are chewing, you are, there is lubrication that is taking place. So lubrication and moistening of dry food by saliva. So you need to moist the food, you need to lubricate the food so that the bolus can easily be swallowed, like I've already explained. So it's for lubrication as well. Then the other significance of mastication is to appreciate of taste. So appreciation of taste of the food you are eating. You know to say on the tongue there, we have the taste buds. In the taste buds, you have the taste cells that are responsible to pick up certain chemicals. And those chemicals, they will initiate uh, action potentials that will be propagated via the cranial nerves to the integratory center within the brain itself then the brain will become aware of what you are eating. It will tell your conscious to say what you're eating is actually salt. What you're eating is sour. What you're eating is chili. What you're eating is what? So for you to appreciate taste, you need to have saliva because saliva is going to dissolve 
the chemicals that are going to stimulate taste sensation. So appreciation of whatever you're eating, you need saliva. That's the reason why when you see nice food or when you smell nice food, you start salivating. You are preparing yourself because that saliva is required to dissolve the chemicals that are going to stimulate the test receptors, which are called test buds. Within the test buds, you have different types of cells, type one, type two, and you have the cells that are responsible to pick up the particular stimuli, which is a chemical, okay? So these are the four significance of mastication. You need to remember them. So there are four, why you should chew. So how is mastication controlled? So what are you going to do to control mastication? So mastication, so the action of mastication is mostly a reflex, a reflex process. So most is just a reflex. So you know to say a reflex is automatic. You don't have control over it. But remember you have the reflex arc, the neural pathway in which the information is going to be transmitted for you to have a receptor. So for a reflex arc, you have a receptor that is going to receive the stimuli. That receptor will generate the receptor potential then you do stimulate the sensory nerve fiber, which is also referred to as the afferent neuron. And this afferent neuron is projecting to the integratory center. The integratory center can be found maybe within the spinal cord or the brain itself or other ganglia that are responsible for interpretation of this sensory information. So after interpretation of that sensory information or integration of the sensory information, the center will stimulate the motor neuron to fire. This motor neuron is innervating the target cells or the target organs. So the target cells now will be stimulated and then you are going to get a response. So what I mean is mastication could be a reflex process whereby you don't have control. It's controlled by autonomic nervous system. You have neurons that are responsible for that. Then it is controlled Sometimes it's also controlled by some muscles that are, are there. So those muscles are controlled by the neuronal uh, function. Like I've already explained to say, you have a, a stimulus that will stimulate a receptor and then the receptor will generate information. It will be processed by the center. Then from there, there will be generation of a motor information that will be transmitted to the target cell. Then you get a response as mastication. Then sometimes it is carried out voluntarily, meaning that you use your conscience, you volunteer to contract certain muscles for you to start chewing. Especially the initial stages of chewing, you are going to volunteer for you to chew. You will start the chewing process. But with time, that um, chewing that is voluntarily, it will be overrided by the reflex arc itself. So it will be taken over by the reflex action. So as you are starting, you know, it's voluntary. And then as you are moving on, you find it becomes involuntary. So you're just chewing without you noticing that you are actually chewing. So the center for mastication is, is situated in the medulla and cerebral cortex. So in the medulla oblongata, that's where you find the mastication centers and also in the cerebral cortex, you have centers. So these are the centers that are integrating the information for chewing. There is a slide that I'll explain. There is more like a diagram. I'll explain a lot what happens there when you're chewing. So muscles of mastication are supplied by mandibular division of the fifth cranial nerve, which is a trigeminal nerve. So these muscles of mastication, like the masseter muscles, they are supplied by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. This is just one of the cranial nerve. I don't know if you've covered that in anatomy. If not, never mind. So this is a chewing reflex. So I've told you to say, as you start chewing, the first phase of mastication is voluntary. So you are doing it using your conscience, but with time, that voluntary activity will be overtaken by a reflex action. So it becomes involuntary now. That's why when you buy a chewing gum, when you place it in the oral cavity, as you are starting to chew it, you are using your conscience. But with time, you forget about the chewing, but you are able to chew the bubble gum. So you find that it becomes a reflex act. It's no longer voluntary at that point of time. That's what I mean. <clears throat> 
So the reflex, uh, the chewing reflex itself, the presence of the bolus of food in the mouth at first initiates a reflex inhibition of the muscles of mastication, which allows the lower jaw to drop. Remember, you have the maxilla or the upper jaw and the lower jaw, which is the mandible. So now when you put your food in the mouth, the presence of the food in the mouth will stimulate certain receptors. Those receptors will generate action potentials. That action potential will go to the centers, the chewing uh, centers. So the chewing centers will be stimulated. Then they'll process that information to say there's a presence of food in the oral cavity. They will send an inhibitory information via the motor neurons to inhibit the muscles of mastication. That will cause your lower jaw to drop. So because there are relaxation of these muscles of mastication, your lower jaw now is going to drop. As you are dropping the lower jaw, it's going to initiate a stretch reflex of the lower jaw. So remember these muscles, you have spindle fibers, you have also gorgy tendon organs. So as you are lowering the lower jaw, you are stretching on the masseter muscles or muscles of mastication. So once the muscles of mastication are stretched, the spindle fibers will be stimulated because there are also sensory receptors that are res responding to stretching. So once they are stimulated, they are going to generate another action potential that will go to the chewing centers. Then the chewing centers will process that information to say the lower jaw is now dropped. They need to generate a stimulatory information now to the muscles of mastication. That will cause contraction of the muscles of mastication. And then the lower jaw is going to be elevated. So you find that there will be a rebound contraction of the lower jaw. So the drop in turn will initiate a stretch reflex of the jaw muscles that will lead to rebound contraction. So now the lower jaw will be elevated. As you are elevating the lower jaw, is going to stimulate certain sensory receptors again. It will send inhibitory information. Then the muscles of mastication are going to be inhibited. You are going to drop the lower jaw again. So this activity will repeat itself. So as the lower jaw rises, then it will cause closure of the teeth. So the compression or the bolus again. So as the bolus is being compressed, that will stimulate certain sensory receptors. So the, the receptors will be stimulated, then it will send now inhibitory information to the muscles of mastication. Then the lower jaw will be lowered again, or it will be dropped. So that's chewing, okay? Let me explain from this diagram, the next diagram, because it's basically the same diagram. So this is the chewing reflex that I'm explaining. So you have muscles of mastication. An example, you have masseter muscles that are touching the lower jaw and the maxilla or the upper jaw. So these are the muscles of mastication, just an example. So the moment you put your food stuff in the oral cavity, you can see there is some food in between the teeth there. There are nerve endings or receptors that are responding to the presence of the food in the oral cavity. So the moment you put food in there, this sensory neuron is going to be stimulated. So you can see the sensory neuron or the afferent neuron that is going to fire an action potential. So the action potential will be propagated towards the central nervous system. In this case, you're talking of the chewing centers that are found within the medulla oblongata. So this sensory neuron is going to inhibit certain interneurons and stimulate other interneurons. So there's this interneuron shown in green here that is communicating with another motor neuron or the efferent neuron that are innervating muscles of mastication, like the masseter muscle here. So this interneuron shown in green is going to be inhibited. It means that the neurotransmitter that is being released here is inhibitory. That will bring about hyperpolarization of the interneuron. Then this interneuron won't fire an action potential. If it's not firing an action potential, it means that the efferent neuron won't fire another action potential. Then the muscles of mastication won't be stimulated to contract. So you can see there's inhibition taking place there then it means that the lower jaw will be dropped because these muscles are going to relax. So the lower jaw will be dropped. 
as the lower jaw is being dropped, at the same time, these muscles of mastication, which is relaxing, there are also other muscles that are responsible to pull the lower jaw down or to drop the lower jaw. Those muscles will be stimulated to contract. So you can see the same sensory neuron that was inhibiting the green interneuron is actually stimulating the red interneuron. So the interneuron shown in red here will be stimulated. So it will fire an action potential that will stimulate the motor neuron innervating the muscles responsible to drop the lower jaw. So this muscle will be stimulated to contract. As this muscle is contracting, is pulling the lower jaw down. So the effect there, the lower jaw will be dropped because the muscles that will pull it down are contracting. The muscles that are supposed to lift it up are relaxing. So the lower jaw is going to be dropped. So as the lower jaw is being dropped here, within these muscles, we have spindle fibers. The spindle fibers are shown on the previous slides. So they are here. So you can see within the muscles here, you have spindle fibers. Then you also have Golgi tendon apparatus or Golgi tendon organ if you want. So you have two things here, spindle fibers and Golgi tendon apparatus. So when the lower jaw is being dropped, some of these muscles are stretched. When they are stretched, the spindle fibers will be stimulated. Then they will generate an action potential that will in turn now cause contraction of muscles of mastication. So the opposite will take place now. So these muscles of mastication will be stimulated to contract, meaning that when the spindle fibers are stimulated, the sensory motor neuron is going, I mean, the sensory fiber, not motor neuron, the sensory fiber or the afferent neuron is going to stimulate this interneuron shown in green. Once the interneuron shown in green is stimulated, it's going to stimulate the motor neuron innervating muscles of mastication. Now muscles of mastication will be stimulated to contract. As the muscles of mastication are contracting, the lower jaw will be elevated. So there is a rebound contraction of the lower jaw. As the lower jaw is closing up, then you also have sensory neurons that will be stimulated there. That will cause inhibition of muscles of mastication. They will relax and then it will drop again. So that process will repeat itself. That's why it's mastication reflex. Okay. I hope we are getting somewhere, but just to add some more information for those who are slow learners, it's basically the same information that I was explaining. So what is deglutition and what are the stages which are involved in deglutition? So this is a question that can come maybe in a test, in an exam, whatever it is. So what is deglutition and what are the stages involved in deglutition? Okay, so if such a question comes, how are you going to answer? this question. So deglutition is different from uh, mastication. Mastication is chewing. Deglutition is swallowing. So now after you've done the chewing, how are you going to swallow? Okay. So how do you define deglutition? Deglutition or swallowing is a process by which food moves from the mouth into the stomach. So we are interested in the oral cavity, the pharynx, in the esophagus. So the movement of the food that you've eaten from the mouth to the stomach, that process is called swallowing, swallowing or deglutition. So the stages of deglutition, there are three major stages or phases of deglutition. We have the oral phase or the oral stage when the food moves from the mouth to the pharynx. So the stages of deglutition is dependent on the, the location of the bolus or the location of the, the food that you're eating. So if the bolus is still in the oral cavity, that stage is called oral stage. Then it will move into the pharynx. When the bolus moves into the pharynx, and then the stage changes into the pharyngeal stage. So you have the pharyngeal stage. So the pharyngeal stage is when the food moves from the pharynx to the esophagus. So the presence of the bolus in the pharynx, it means that now you've entered the pharyngeal stage. So it has to move now from the pharynx into the esophagus. So the last phase or stage of deglutition is the esophageal uh, stage. The esophageal stage or the esophageal phase is when food is moving now from the esophagus to the stomach. So these are the three 
main stages of deglutition, the oral stage, the pharyngeal stage, and the esophageal stage. And these stages is dependent on the location of the bolus. So if the bolus is still in the oral cavity, oral phase, then the bolus will move into the pharyngeal. So once it moves into the, the pharynx, then it becomes pharyngeal stage. If the bolus moves into the esophagus, then it becomes the esophageal stage. Then the bolus will be able to move all the way to the stomach. So it's not actually the bolus that is necessarily moving on its own. There are muscles that are contracting to facilitate the movement of the bolus. So those are the propulsive contractions that will move the bolus from the oral phase into the pharynx, from the pharynx into the esophagus, from the esophagus all the way into the stomach. So the control of deglutition, of course, there are cranial nerves that are involved. So in this diagram, you can see the swallowing center. The swallowing center is not the same as the, the chewing center. So chewing or mastication centers are different from the swallowing center. So the swallowing centers are the ones that are going to control swallowing. So there's a network of nerve supply to the organs of the GIT that are involved in swallowing. So you can see the soft palate is innervated by trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve number five. Then you have portions of the pharynx that is innervated by the grossopharyngeal or the cranial nerve number nine. Then you also see that part of the, the pharynx and the esophagus is heavily innervated by the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is cranial nerve number 10. So these are the cranial nerves that are innervating these structures. So there is sensory information that will be generated once the, the receptors are stimulated, then they will propagate that information to the swallowing center. Then at the swallowing center, they're going to interpret that information and generate another motor information that will cause contraction of muscles of the pharynx, muscles of the esophagus and other muscles, muscles associated with the soft palate. Then, of course, there is innervation to the epiglottis and the larynx. And I'll explain what happens during swallowing or deglutition. So it's not this simple. It's actually a well-coordinated process that you need to understand. So to summarize deglutition or the transfer of the bolus from the mouth to the esophagus requires multiple events. So these are the events that are summarized in this table. So deglutition can take about 1.2 minutes. 1.2, not minutes, but seconds, actually, not minutes. So you, you swallow within seconds. So within 1.2 seconds, then the, the, the bolus has already moved from the pharynx or from the oral cavity all the way to the stomach. So just 1.2 seconds. So it's very fast. Okay. So the first phase or the first part of deglutition, the bolus is still in the mouth. Remember, I told you to say, we have three phases or stages of swallowing dependent on the location of the bolus. So if the bolus is still in the mouth, then you have the oral phase. When the bolus moves into the pharynx, then you have the pharyngeal stage. When the bolus moves into the esophagus, then you have esophageal stage. So these are the stages of swallowing. So from zero seconds to about 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 seconds, the, the bolus is still within the mouth. So you are preparing yourself to swallow, okay? So deglutition is also divided into voluntary stage and involuntary stage. So when the bolus is still in the mouth, you, you can still control the swallowing, so it's voluntary, but at certain stage, it becomes involuntary. You have no control over it. It's taken up by the autonomic nervous system, especially the cranial nerves that are responsible for the glutition. So as you are preparing yourself to swallow, the tongue thrusts up and back. So it means the tongue will move upwards and it will contract more on the caudal aspect towards the opening of the pharynx. Video. So the question was, what is deglutition and what are the stages of, which are involved? So I told you to say there are three stages that are involved. The oral phase, 
the pharyngeal phase and the esophageal phase of deglutition. So part of the oral phase, it's voluntary, meaning that you volunteer to swallow something. But after you, you volunteer to swallow, later on, that swallowing reflex will be taken up by a voluntary phase. So now it becomes involuntary. You don't have control how the bolus is going to move from the pharynx to the esophagus, from the esophagus to the stomach. So it becomes involuntary because part of it is voluntary and part of it is involuntary. So you have the autonomic nervous system that is innovating the structures of the mouth, structures of the pharynx, structures of the esophagus. So you have those cranial nerves, the trigeminal nerve, the fascial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and also the vagus nerve, the cranial nerve number 10. So those are the, the, the cranial nerves that are innervating these structures. And of course, there are sensory receptors that are sensing the location of the bolus. So as the bolus is moving, it's also stretching certain stretch receptors that are going to respond. The presence of chemicals as well, they are also stimulating chemoreceptors that can also generate action potentials. All these action potentials are sensory in function, so they will be transmitting information to the swallowing center. Then the swallowing center is going to interpret that information to say the bolus is about to be swallowed. Now can I cause certain muscles to contract? Can I cause the epiglottis to close the trachea? Can I cause the contraction of the vocal cords so that uh, the bolus doesn't move into the, the, the trachea? And can I also cause the elevation of the larynx? So that the only way the bolus can move is into the esophagus from the pharynx. So you know all those stages. So let's start. So on average, we say it, it will take about 1.2 seconds for someone to swallow. So the first stage is the when the bolus is within the mouth. So the tongue is going to thrust upwards. So it's going to contract and then to move backwards. So pushing the bolus against the hard palate, then the soft palate. So this bolus now is being squeezed towards the pharynx. The pharynx is open. It's going to receive the bolus. So now the nasopharynx is going to be closed. Why? You don't want this bolus to go into the nasal cavity. So the nasopharynx is going to close up so that whatever you're about to swallow doesn't move into the nasal cavity. Then the larynx is going to be elevated. So now the bolus moves into the pharynx. So once it moves into the pharynx, it becomes the pharyngeal stage. So in the pharyngeal stage, you don't want this bolus to move into the trachea. So the laryngeal muscles are going to contract so that the larynx is elevated. So you can see here that the larynx is elevated. Then the airway is going to be closed. How is the airway going to be closed? You have the epiglottis that will close the airway. So the epiglottis now will close the airway, then the upper esophageal sphincter is going to open. So the upper esophageal sphincter is going to open to receive the bolus. So once the upper esophageal sphincter opens, the pharyngeal muscles are going to contract to squeeze the bolus. So these pharyngeal muscles to contract, they need to be stimulated. That's why I'm saying that they are heavily innervated by cranial nerves. So that have the uh, motor neurons that are innervating these muscles. So the pharyngeal muscles are going to contract to squeeze the bolus. Then the upper esophageal sphincter is already open. So this bolus now will move into the esophagus. Then the stage changes now into the esophageal stage or phase. So the bolus enters the esophagus. Then in the esophagus doesn't spend much time. So within just uh, within one second or 0 0.8 seconds, uh, the food stuff will already be moved into the stomach. So it doesn't spend much time within the esophagus because those muscles are contracting. Then the bolus will move to the stomach. So this is the glutition process. It, on average, it takes about 1.2 seconds. Okay. So the normal swallowing reflex, so these are the centers that are involved. So we said we have the cortical areas that are responsible for swallowing. Then you also have brainstem areas like in the medulla oblongata, the swallowing centers. Then you have the motor nuclei that are going to stimulate the motor neurons innervating structures or the pharynx structures or the esophagus. 
So you have the oropharynx and the esophagus that are heavily innervated by cranial nerves, especially the somatic branches of cranial nerves. And you also have sensory branches of these same cranial nerves. So once the cortical areas of swallowing are stimulated by the afferent neurons and also the swallowing center are stimulated, there is communication via the motor neuron nuclei that will be stimulated to cause another action potential to go and stimulate those muscles to contract that are involved in swallowing. So this is just a summary of swallowing reflex. So more information that is added to the swallowing reflex is the same. So you can see the structures that are innervated by the cranial nerves. I think I mentioned these structures that are innervated. So you can see the soft palate, the hard palate, and the ovula is innervated by trigeminal nerve. Then you have structures of the oropharynx that are innervated by the grossopharyngeal and also by the vagus nerve. The esophagus, I said, mainly is innervated by the vagus nerve. So you have sensory information that is coming once the stretch receptors, the chemoreceptors are stimulated by the presence of the bolus. So it will send sensory information to the swallowing center. The swallowing center will know the position of the bolus, and then it will send the motor information to cause contraction of these muscles so that the bolus can move. So you have the oral phase, pharyngeal phase, and esophageal phase, which I've already explained. If a question comes by means of simple diagrams, show the three stages of deglutition. So it's the same one. So the three stages, oral phase, pharyngeal phase, and esophageal phase. So these are the diagrams, depending on the location of the bolus. So we have A here, which is called the preparatory stage, which is voluntary. So you are preparing yourself to swallow. So it's voluntary. It's part of the, uh, of the oral phase to some extent. Then you have the oral, oral stage, whereby the bolus is still in the oral cavity. Then you have the, the pharyngeal stage, the bolus has moved into the pharynx. Then last, you have the esophageal stage, when the bolus is in the esophagus. So it's something that we've already discussed, so you don't have to waste time. Show the sequence of events during the first stage of swallowing. It's actually the same information. So during the first stage of swallowing, which is the oral phase. So the bolus is placed over the posterior dorsal surface of the tongue. It is called the preparatory position. So that is a preparatory position. When the tongue is contracting to push the bolus against the soft palate and the hard palate. So you find that the bolus is placed over the posterior dorsal surface of the tongue. So this is called the preparatory position. Then the anterior part of the tongue is retracted during contraction and depressed. So it's going to retract it and depress so that the, the, the bolus now is pushed against the soft and hard palate. Then the posterior part of the tongue is elevated and retracted against the hard palate, like I mentioned. So this will now push the bolus backwards into the pharynx. So the pharynx is going to receive the bolus and then it will enter the pharyngeal stage. So the forceful contraction of the tongue against the palate produces a positive pressure in the posterior part of the oral cavity. This also pushes the food into the pharynx. So this is just a movement of the bolus into the pharynx from the pharynx esophagus, from esophagus into the stomach, the glutition. Okay, so it's basically the same. So the first, the upper esophageal sphincter, it has to relax. Then for the stomach to receive the, the bolus, the lower esophageal sphincter, it has to relax towards the end. So the esophageal phase, I've already said it's involuntary because you don't volunteer. You, you, you don't have control over it. What is controlling it is autonomic nervous system, especially the cranial nerve. So it becomes involuntary. So the pharyngeal phase and the esophageal phase, those are involuntary. So the information is the same. So it begins once the, uh, the food bolus enter or enters the esophagus, peristalsis pushes the bolus onwards. So this is peristaltic contractions. So you can see a wave of contraction behind the bolus that will now squeeze the bolus to move to a, to a second segment. So the bolus will be moving forward because the smooth muscles behind the bolus will be contracting. The smooth muscles in front of the bolus will be relaxing. That mechanism 
we we'll explain when we start looking at peristaltic contractions. Okay. Otherwise, all the information here we've already discussed. So at the lower of the esophagus, we have the lower esophageal sphincter, which is also called the cardiac sphincter, that is going to relax. So the cardiac sphincter is relaxing because of the trigeminal innervation that will inhibit those move muscles to contract. So there will be release of inhibitory neurotransmitters that will cause the uh, cardiac sphincter or the lower esophageal muscles to relax. Then the bolus can easily be accepted by the stomach or it will be received by the stomach. Okay, same stages. So we are done with the first lecture for today, but we still have to discuss the other lectures because they are all talking about motility. So, so far we've just discussed motility from the storm, I mean, from the oral cavity all the way to the, So now the bolus has moved from the oral cavity into the stomach. That process is called swallowing. So we've looked at mastication or chewing in the oral cavity, which is a special type of motility. We've also looked at deglutition by which the bolus is going to move from the oral cavity all the way to the stomach via the pharynx and the esophagus. So now the bolus has moved into the stomach what sort of motility are you going to appreciate in the stomach? So now we're looking at gastric motility and emptying, which is a special type of motility that takes place in the stomach. So after there's mixing contractions, there's digestion of proteins and other molecules, you need to empty the stomach so that the chyme can move from the stomach into the duodenum. So what is controlling the gastric emptying? She is also a special type of motility. Okay, so we proceed. So what are the learning objectives for this lecture? So at the end of the lecture, a learner must be able to explain the gastric motility and emptying. You are also supposed to be able to describe the regulation of gastric motility and emptying. So what is controlling the motility or the stomach and gastric emptying? So you all need to understand all that. So the motor functions of the stomach, what are the major motor functions of the stomach? Motor function of the stomach. So there are the three folds of motor function of the stomach. So there are three motor functions of the stomach. The first one, of course, is a storage of large quantities. So storage of large quantities of food until the food can be processed in the duodenum in the lower intestinal tract. Remember, we talked about the gastrointestinal reflexes. So we say that if the small intestines, the large intestines, they have a lot of uh, chyme in there, they will inhibit the stomach to empty their content into the duodenum so that it provides enough time for those fecal material to move from the colon to the rectum and also to evacuate the, the colon. So when the food is also moving into the stomach, the stretching of the stomach will cause gastropoic reflexes that will cause evacuation of the colon. So all that we explained. So now, if there's a lot of chyme in the small intestines, large intestines, it means that it's not necessary for the stomach to empty its content into the duodenum at that point. So the stomach has to store the, the food or the chyme within the stomach itself to provide enough time for digestion and movement of the chyme from the small intestine to the large intestine. So that now the small intestines will be ready to receive more chyme. So that's why the stomach will function as a storage organ or a reservoir for the food. So food will spend some time within the stomach. So it can spend even about two hours, sometimes 30 minutes. So it's dependent on the type of food you are eating. Certain type of food to spend more time in the stomach, especially when you eat fat. So when you eat fat, a lot of fat, it will spend more time in the stomach. If you eat carbohydrates, they don't spend much time. Proteins will also spend a bit of time in the stomach. So the different types of food will have an effect on how much time it will spend in the stomach. So the first motor function of the stomach 
It will function as a storage of large quantities of food until the food can be processed in the duodenum and lower intestinal tracts. Second one, mixing of this food with gastric secretions until it forms a semi-fluid mixture, which is called chyme. So the mixing contractions taking place within the stomach is mixing the bolus with the secretions until that solid bolus is converted into the semi-liquid or semi-fluid mixture, which is called chyme. So once you have chyme, then you have a lot of enzymes that will continue digestion. Then when this chyme moves into the duodenum, then digestion will continue from there. Then the last motor function of the stomach, slow emptying of the chyme from the stomach into the small intestines at a rate suitable for, pro, uh, for proper digestion and absorption by the small intestines. So emptying is another function. So we said the first one is storage of food. The second one, we said mixing so that now the bolus is converted into chyme. Then the last one, emptying of the stomach. So the chyme that has been formed now, it has to move into the duodenum. So the stomach is responsible to empty the chyme into the small intestines at a controlled rate suitable for digestion and absorption to take place. Okay, so the food from the esophagus is stored in the stomach. So we say that stomach can also function as a reservoir to store large quantities of food in the stomach. Then it will be mixed with acid, mucus, and pepsin. Pepsin is the enzyme that is found in the stomach. So it's produced by the chief cells as pepsinogen. Then it will be secreted to be released into the lumen of the stomach. Then in the lumen of the stomach, you have hydrochloric acid that will activate it. So it will be converted into pepsin from pepsinogen. So once it has become pepsin, it will start the digestion of proteins. So mixing of the food with the acids, mucus, and pepsin. And they'll be released at a controlled rate from the stomach into the duodenum. So this is the gastric emptying that is taking place there. So both peristaltic and segmental contractions occur in the stomach. So these are the special types of motility that is taking place in the stomach. We have peristaltic contractions and also segmental contractions. Segmental contractions are more of mixing contractions. So certain segments of the JT are contracting, other segments are relaxing, then they will change. Those which were relaxing, they'll contract. Those segments which were contracting, they will relax. So these are segmental contractions, which are mixing contractions. The peristaltic contractions are responsible to propel the foot or the chyme from one point to another point. Then regulation is achieved through the integration of neural reflexes and hormonal influences mediated via enteric and autonomic nervous system. So we already looked at control the GIT. So this motility is controlled by the enteric nervous supply, which is a submucosa in the myenteric plexus. Remember the myenteric plexus is also referred to as Albach uh, plexus. Then the submucosa is also referred to as mesinas plexus, mesinas plexus. So the myenteric is the one that is mainly involved in motility. So that is going to control the motility or the contractions of the stomach. But of course, we have interstitial cells of Kaja that are responsible to generate pacemaker potentials called the slow waves. The slow waves are the ones that will initiate now the, the presence of spike potentials. So the spike potentials will appear when the slow waves depolarize to the threshold. So the membrane potential is always fluctuating between negative 60 millivolts to negative 40 millivolts. So those slow waves, when they depolarize to negative 40 millivolts, then they will fire the spike potentials. The spike potentials will stimulate the smooth muscle cells to contract so that you have motility in the GIT. Okay, so that's regulation. And of course, you have hormones like gastrin, gastric inhibitory polypeptide that will have an effect on the motility of the stomach or the contractility of the stomach. So the stomach has three anatomical divisions, the fundus, the body, and the antrum that you know. So you have the first part, which is the cardia. The cardia, this is where you find the cardiac sphincter. 
or the lower esophageal sphincter, we have the fundus, the body, and the antrum. Then after the antrum, of course, we have the pyloric sphincter, and that location is called the pyrolus. The oral region of the stomach includes the lower esophageal sphincter, the fundus, and the proximal body. They contain oncytic glands. The oncytic glands, actually, well, we don't really know the function of these glands, but we also have gastric pits or glands that produce a lot of uh, factors like hydrochloric acid, the intrinsic factor. They can produce a lot of a lot of things and other hormones. You have different types of cells there that are responsible for production of a lot of things. Parietal cells, the mucus cells, the goblet cells, you all find them there. So the oral region of the stomach includes the lower esophageal sphincter, the fundus, and the proximal body. So this is the oral region of the stomach. So it will contain a lot of glands and is responsible for receiving the ingested meal because it's the, the oral region. So they are closer to the oral cavity, hence the name oral region, towards the oral cavity. So the, this is a portion that is responsible to receive the bolus. Then we have the corded region. The corded region of the stomach includes the antrum, the distal body. And so the distal body is the distal part of the body for the stomach. And then we also have the pyloric sphincter. That is part of the corded region of the stomach. And this part is responsible for contractions that will mix the food and propel it into the duodenum. So the corded region is responsible for mixing contractions or segmental contractions. It's also responsible for gastric emptying. So the emptying of chyme into the duodenum is the, the responsibility of the corded region of the stomach. So these are the two major portions the oral region and the corded region or the stomach. So from this diagram, you can see the oral region, you have the lower esophageal sphincter, the fundus and the proximal part of the body. And then the corded region is the distal part of the body, the, the antrum and also the pyloric sphincter. So this part is the one that is responsible for mixing contractions and emptying of the chyme then the oral region is going to receive the bolus from the esophagus. Moving on to receptive relaxation of the stomach. Receptive relaxation of the stomach. So when you're about to swallow or when bolus has moved into the stomach, the stomach is going to relax more to allow more food to move into the stomach. So you have the food particles that you are swallowing that will move into the stomach. So the stomach has to relax to allow more food to move into the stomach. So that is called receptive relaxation. You anticipate that you're about to eat or you are starting to eat. Then the stomach is going to relax to increase the volume so that you eat a lot. So this is an example of vago vago reflex. So a vago vago reflex that is initiated by distension of the stomach and is abolished by vagotomy. Vagotomy simply means that cutting off the vagus nail. So when you cut the vagus nail, you are cutting the innervation, innervation to the stomach. So you find that receptive relaxation won't take place if you cut off the vagus nail because it's the vagus nail that is sending inhibitory neurotransmitters to bring about relaxation of the stomach during receptive relaxation. So the oral region of the stomach relaxes to accommodate the ingested meal. So the oral region that is receiving the meal is the one that is going to relax to accommodate more ingester to move into the stomach. And it's mediated by vagal afferent stimulations and movement of the pharynx and the esophagus. So this is innervated by autonomic nervous system, especially the, the cranial nerves that are involved in here. So when, as you are chewing, there is information that is going to the brain and then the brain will interpret to so say you're about to chew. Then there will be information that will be sent to the stomach to cause relaxation of the stomach. That is referred to as receptive relaxation of the stomach. 
Then there are also hormones that will participate in the receptive relaxation of the stomach. An example given here is cholecystokinin. So the cholecystokinin is going to participate in receptive relaxation by increasing the uh, distensibility of the oral stomach. So the distensibility of the oral stomach is going to increase by inhibiting gastric motility. So cholecystokinin is an example of a hormone that will cause, that will result in two. So what I'm saying is the cholecystokinin, the cholecystokinin is an example of a hormone that will cause uh, hyperpolarization of the, the cells. So the cells will be hyperpolarized and once they are hyperpolarized, they are going to relax. So when they relax, it means that they are, the stomach is relaxing that will allow uh, a lot of food to move into the stomach. Then we have mixing movements of the stomach. So we are done with the receptive relaxation of the stomach. What are the mixing movements? So the mixing movements are just examples of segmental contractions. So the coded region of the stomach is going to contract to mix the food with gastric secretions and begin the process of digestion and the size of the food particles is going to reduce. So as the mixing contractions are mixing the chyme, I mean, uh, the, the bolus with the gastric fluids, then you find that the size of these food particles is going to be reduced. Then it will be converted into chyme once it has been mixed with gastric secretions. So the slow waves initiated by interstitial cells of Cargill in the coded stomach occur at a frequency of three to four waves per minute. So we say that the interstitial cells of Cargill in the stomach, they are capable of generating slow waves at a frequency of three to four waves per minute. And these slow waves, when they depolarize to the threshold, they'll fire action potentials. They are the actual action potentials that will stimulate the smooth muscle cell to contract. So they will depolarize the smooth muscle cells and then they will contract. The smooth muscle cells will contract. That will bring about mixing movements. So if the threshold is reduced during the slow waves, action potentials are fired. So if the threshold is reached, not reduced. If the threshold is reached during the slow waves, then the action potential will be fired followed by a contraction. So remember for you to have a contraction, you need action potentials. The action potentials here are called spike potentials. So the slow waves will depolarize the threshold to fire spike potentials and these spike potentials will stimulate the smooth muscle cells to contract. The frequency of slow waves sets the maximal frequency of contraction. So the more slow waves you have, the more the action potentials, the more mixing contractions you're going to have. That's what that statement means. So a wave of contraction causes the distal antrum. So you have this wave of contraction that will cause the distal antrum so much that the corded stomach contracts. So the corded stomach or the caudal part of the stomach is going to contract and food is propelled back into the stomach. This will produce the mixing contractions or the retropulsions. So the retropulsions are the mixing contractions because you have a wave of, of contraction that will move all the way to the coded region of the stomach. Then the coded region is going to contract. Then the chyme is not being emptied into the duodenum. Then it will be toasted back into the stomach. So the toasting back of the, the food into the stomach or the ingestion into the stomach will bring about mixing contractions. So gastric contractions are increased by vagal stimulation and are decreased by sympathetic stimulation. So these gastric contractions, they're going to be increased by vagal stimulation because the vagus part, you have the parasympathetic that is going to release acetylcholine. And this acetylcholine, it will cause depolarization of um, my enteric plexus, depolarization of smooth muscle cells, and then the contractility is going to increase. But the sympathetic stimulation, we all know that that is going to inhibit the contractility to the stomach. Why? There is production of no epinephrine. The no epinephrine is going to cause hyperpolarization of these smooth muscle cells. It will be very difficult for them to be firing action potentials. So they become less excitable. They will start relaxing. So it means the motility is enhanced by the parasympathetics, but it will be inhibited by 
the sympathetics. So even during fasting, contractions, which are called the migrating myoelectric complexes, they will occur at 90 minute interval. Why? It's because we said there is a hormone that is produced when you are fasting and that hormone is called motlin hormone. So the motlin hormone is the one that is responsible for these contractions when the GIT is empty. And these contractions will clear the stomach of the residual food. So some residual food that will remain in the stomach will be cleared by the effect of motlin. So motlin is the mediator of these contractions of which I already mentioned. Okay, so in this diagram, we can see both movement of kind, which are due to peristaltic contractions. Then we can also see mixing contractions. So we have mixing contractions, then also propulsive contractions that will move chyme from the stomach into the duodenum. So I'll explain from this diagram. This is just more like the summary of what we are looking at. So let's start. So the first one, you know to say you have peristaltic contractions that will originate in the upper fundus and it's going to sweep down toward the pyloric sphincter. So you have this wave of contraction that is starting from the fundus of the stomach. So the fundus of the stomach is going to contract. So you have the wave of contraction that is moving towards the coded region of the stomach. So as this wave of contraction is moving towards the coded region of the stomach, what will happen at two here? So you can see the contraction becomes more vigorous as it reaches a thicker muscled antrum. So the antrum is very thick. It has got a lot of smooth muscles. So as the wave of contraction is reaching the antrum, even the force of contraction is going to increase because we have a lot of smooth muscle cells there. So the strong anterior contraction propels the chyme forward. So it's going to propel this chyme forward. So the chyme is being squeezed towards the pyloric sphincter, which you can see because the antrum now is contracting with a greater force of contraction. Then a small portion of chyme is pushed through the partial or the partially open sphincter into the duodenum. So a small portion of chyme will be pushed now into the duodenum. Why is because the pyloric sphincter here is partially open. So if the wave of contraction is moving towards the coded region of the stomach, then some of this chyme is pushed against the pyloric sphincter. So if the pyloric sphincter is not fully closed, it's partially open, some of the chyme now will be spatting into the duodenum. So there is spatting of the chyme into the duodenum or the oozing out of chyme into the duodenum. So you can see that movement. So this is called gastric emptying. So some of the chyme will move into the duodenum. Okay, that's what it means. So the stronger the anterior contraction, the more chyme is emptied with each contractile wave. So if the wave of contraction is stronger, there is more chyme that will move into the duodenum. If the wave of contraction is weak, just small amount of chyme will move into the duodenum, which is called gastric emptying. Then you can see on number five here, when the peristaltic contraction reaches the pyloric sphincter, the sphincter is tightly closed and no further emptying takes place. So this same wave of contraction, when it reaches the pyloric sphincter, the pyloric sphincter is also going to contract more then it's going to be fully closed. So now it's not partially open, it will be fully closed. So when the pyloric sphincter is fully closed, this time that is being pushed towards the pyloric sphincter will be tossed back into the stomach. So these now produce mixing contractions. So when the chyme that was being propelled forward hits the closed sphincter, it is tossed back into the antrum, mixing the chyme then the mixing chyme is accomplished as chyme is propelled forward and tossed back into the antrum with each peristaltic contraction. So there is now movement of chyme forward and back. So it will move forward if the pyloric sphincter is closed, then it will be tossed back into the antrum. So this is that, that is going to produce gastric mixing contractions. So it will be mixing contractions, it's not emptying contraction. It not, it's not going to bring about emptying of the chyme. So gastric emptying and regulation, okay? 
gastric emptying and regression. We only have a minute. When it, when it cuts, you can just join just for 20 minutes to be able to finish this lecture for today. So gastric emptying and regulation. What is going to regulate the gastric emptying? So the coded region of the stomach contracts to propel food into the duodenum. Of course, we'll say the coded region is going to contract to propel chyme into the duodenum. So this chyme is moving via the partially open uh, sphincter, which is called the pyloric sphincter. Then that will bring about emptying of chyme into the duodenum. But the rate of gastric emptying Okay, so now we're looking at gastric emptying and regulation. What is involved in gastric emptying and regulation of gastric emptying? So I've already mentioned to say we have mixing contractions and propulsive contractions. So in the stomach, those propulsive contractions are the ones that are responsible for gastric emptying. So you have a wave of contraction that will start from the fundus of the body, it will move to the body or the stomach, and then it will move all the way to the antrium of the, of the stomach. So the anterior muscles are very thick. So when the wave of contraction reaches there, the force of contraction is going to increase. So the chyme will be propelled against the pyloric sphincter, which is partially open. If it's partially open, then some amount of chyme will now be spatting out of the stomach into the duodena via the partially open pyloric sphincter. When the wave of contraction reaches the pyloric sphincter, the pyloric sphincter is going to contract more, then it will be fully closed. Once it's fully closed, the chyme that is propelled forward, it's going to be tossed backwards again into the antrum of the, or, or the stomach. So there is a forward and tossing of the chyme back into the antrum of the body that will produce the mixing contractions. But what is controlling the gastric emptying? So I've told you to say you have intrinsic nervous supply to the GIT that is responsible for that. And also some amount of hormones. We have hormones that could be inhibitory to the motility of the GIT. It will have an effect on gastric emptying. So inhibitory hormones like cholecystokinin that is going to inhibit the stomach to contract. And then you also have gastric inhibitory polypeptide is also going to inhibit the stomach to contract. So all those are involved in gastric emptying, okay? Or regulation of gastric emptying. So the rate of gastric emptying depends on also the different types of food stuff that you are eating. I've already told you to say when you eat fat or lipids, fat will spend more time in the stomach, followed by proteins. Then the last are carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, if you eat carbohydrates, they don't spend much time in the stomach. Then they'll be emptied into the duodenum, which makes sense because in the stomach, you don't have digestion of carbohydrates. So why should carbohydrates spend more time in the stomach? Okay, so the rate of gastric emptying will depend on the following factors. The first factor is isotonicity, isotonicity or osmolality of the stomach contents. So the osmolality or the stomach content will also have an effect on gastric emptying. If the stomach contents are hypertonic or hypotonic, gastric emptying is slowed via the negative feedback. So you have enterogastric feedback mechanism. The kind that is moving into the duodenum, if it's hypertonic or hypotonic, the, the duodenum will send inhibitory information to the stomach so that gastric emptying is inhibited to some extent. Why is because you don't want hypertonic chyme or hypotonic chyme to move into the duodenum. That will have an effect on the pH and also to have an effect on the enzymes that are operating there. So you find that gastric emptying will be delayed until the, the hypertonic or hypotonic chyme is changed. Okay, so there are factors that will regulate or modify the chyme itself so that it doesn't become hypertonic or hypotonic. So it will be more of isotonic. So the isotonicity it will have an effect. Okay, so I can see a hand. So the isotonicity or the osmolality to the stomach would have an effect on gastric emptying, like I've already explained. So via the negative feedback mechanism, if you have hypertonic or hypotonic gastric chyme, then the gastric emptying will be slowed down. 
to modify the kind. Then the type of food ingested, it will have an effect. I've already explained to say carbohydrates doesn't spend much time, it's just within a few hours in the stomach. Then you have proteins that will spend a bit of time in the stomach. Then fats, fat to spend more time in the stomach. So the type of food you're eating, it will have an effect on gastric emptying. So fat inhibits gastric motility. So because fat is going to inhibit gastric motility, it will spend more time in the stomach because the emptying will be slowed down. So it increases gastric emptying time. So the gastric emptying time will be increased because it's spending more time in the stomach by stimulating the release of cholecystokinin. So the, the fat is going to stimulate the eye cells to produce a lot of cholecystokinin. This cholecystokinin is going to inhibit gastric emptying. That's why fat will spend more time in the stomach. Then the acidity of chyme, the hydrogen ions in the duodenum, it will also have an effect on gastric emptying. So the hydrogen ions in the duodenum, they are going to inhibit gastric emptying via the direct neural reflexes. So you have the local reflexes, neural reflexes. If you have a lot of chyme, which is acidic, moving into the duodenum, you have cells that are going to be stimulated there, then they'll send inhibitory neurotransmitters to the stomach to inhibit the contraction of the stomach. And also you have the release of certain hormones like secretin hormones, gastric inhibitory peptides that will inhibit gastric emptying. So hydrogen ion receptors in the duodenum will relay information to the gastric smooth muscles via interneurons of gastri gastrointestinal plexuses. So you have those gastrointestinal plexuses, the myenteric and the submucosa. So they are going to release inhibitory neurotransmitters there, okay? So the two mechanisms that will inhibit gastric motility, so secretions and also the adrenal feeding. So what are the two mechanisms? So you have neuronal mechanism and hormonal mechanism. So you have neuro interogastric reflexes, so the neurons that are inhibiting gastric motility. Then you also have hormonal, so hormonal, you have interogastron or hormones mechanism. So it's either the neurons or the hormones that are inhibiting gastric motility, secretions, and also the odino feeling. This table or diagram is summarizing the regulation of the GIT, the hormonal and the neuro regulation of gastric emptying. So let's start. Let's start from the presence of fat hypertonic acidic chyme in the duodenum. So once the duodenum receive a chyme that has a lot of fat or hypertonic or hypotonic chyme or acidic chyme in the duodenum, it will stimulate the neuronal and the hormonal mechanisms that will inhibit gastric emptying. So the duodenal enteroendocrine cells are going to be stimulated. That will produce a lot of hormones. So the hormones that are going to be produced there is secretin, cholecystokinin, gastric inhibitory peptide. So these are called enterogastrons. So the enterogastrons are hormones that are produced by the mucosa cells. So you have the production of secretin by the A cells. So we have the A cells that can produce the secretin. We have the I cells that can produce cholecystokinin. Then you have other mucosa cells that can produce gastric inhibitory peptide. So these hormones are inhibitory. They are going to inhibit the motility or the GIT. So the contractile force and the rate of stomach emptying is going to decline. Why? It's because they are inhibitory hormones. So they will control the gastric emptying. Then you have the neural control or reflexes. Depending on the presence of the chyme, you have chemicals produced there because the chyme contain chemicals from digestion. So the chemoreceptors and such receptors are going to be stimulated. The chemoreceptors, they are responding to chemicals like hydrogen ions, amino acids, free fatty acids. Then the stretch receptors are responding to stretching. So once they are stimulated, they are going to generate an action potential via the short reflexes and the long reflexes. So the short reflexes, you have the enteric neurons, the enteric nervous supply, that will produce inhibitory neurotransmitters to inhibit gastric emptying. 
Then you also have the long reflexes that will be interpreted by the central nervous system. So it will go to the centers in the central nervous system. The sympathetic branch of autonomic nervous system is going to increase, the parasympathetic is going to decrease. So in order to say the sympathetic autonomic nervous system is going to release a lot of epinephrine, no epinephrine, that is inhibitory because it will cause hyperpolarization of these uh, smooth muscle cells or the GIT. So once the smooth muscle cells in the stomach are hyperpolarized, they will become less excitable. They can't fire action potentials. They can't get stimulated for them to contract. So they'll start relaxing. So that will send inhibitory information. Okay, so this is what is going to control gastric emptying. With that information, we are done for today. So we've looked.